Hello, everybody, again. Thanks very much for coming on Sunday. Fantastic. So, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, represent a slightly different um, group of people interested in uh, pre primary or very young learners' language development because I'm a teacher and not really an Angla mama or a bilingual parent. So I'm going to talk about this situation um, and uh, I'm going to talk about teaching very young learners um, from the teacher's perspective. Um, okay, let's see how it works. If it does, good, it works, perfect. So um, just to check, are here any, do we have any people here who are just teachers like me? Yes, good, teacher power, fantastic, okay. So, um, yeah, Lisa already uh, mentioned all that. I'm just going to actually clarify once again that my um, background and my education are connected with language teaching. So I have um, Cambridge Delta thing, which is um, a course and a diploma in teaching English to adults. So I'm like, trained and certified to teach uh, all sorts of people English. Um, there is also this um, International House Certificate in Teaching Young Learners and uh, again that's a training um, exactly for teachers who work with um, small kids. I have about 10 or maybe a bit more years experience of teaching young learners, young and very young too. So my um, comments and my, um, like what I'm going to share is again from the teacher's perspective. Um, a couple of words about the context. Okay. Um, I think even uh, maybe several years ago, maybe four or five or maybe a bit more years ago, when I first um, met parents of um, children who um, are sort of bilingual by the age of uh, maybe five or six, so can speak English um, quite fluently, um, I was very surprised, and I think even about five or six years ago, that was quite rare, even in Moscow. And I think the situation was uh, maybe like still common in families where one parent is um, like has a, another native language, uh, maybe American um, English or like British English, because they are from the states or from the UK. Um, but now we are meeting more and more families where um, children are bilingual, not because one of parents is initially um, bilingual, but because one parent chooses to introduce another language and um, to promote it in the family, and so more and more children are becoming bilingual. I think what also is very common now is um, lots of like Russian speaking parents choose to send their children to like an American kindergarten or certain play groups. They're like international schools and they have like pre, um, preschool um, play groups and everything. So we are now seeing more and more kids who are bilingual and basically my impression is like amazingly it works. Um, however, um, I'm still in the sector that provides not actually like kindergarten or playgroup sort of activities for young children. But we still do a, this very classical thing of having sort of lessons with um, small kids twice a week, um, 45 minutes or so. And um, I'm going to talk about some techniques, some very specific techniques that we use, uh, that we, I enjoy using. And maybe it can be practical for both teachers and parents too. So, um, because um, I teach only twice a week, and that's not really the 30% of waking time mentioned before, um, clearly the results I'm expecting are going to be very different. So what we, I think, can naturally expect to see by the end of this school year is actually children acquiring a number of single words and chunks, so phrases that they can exchange when they are in this English environment. And they actually can do quite well. They can uh, ask for things, 
They can um, do some simple games that we play. They can take on different roles. And uh, even by the end of this first year, uh, spent in these short, um, like, 30-minute lessons, children are able to say quite um, a lot of English things. So, um, <laughs> because we are um, dealing with such little um, time bits, the materials that we use, that I use, of course, have to be um, like really well prepared and they have to be like really designed for the purpose of working with small kids exactly in these um, 30 minute, like 45 minute chunks. So for me, it's really, really important that the materials we use are engaging, which means children generally want to do something with them. It's not like something lying like a book or um, an object that child has no interest in. So materials should be engaging and just by nature make children want to do something with them, to manipulate with them somehow. Um, it's crucial that these materials are, or what we do is memorable. And uh, by saying memorable, I think we all understand that memorable for young kids means um, involving movement and of course involving emotion. Um, clearly, when uh, a parent talks um, to a child in their um, shared language, there is lots of um, emotional engagement from both of them, and that's one very big part that helps children to retain the language. Even in language classes, we try to recreate the situation and make the language we use emotional, and, well, we try to add movement there. Because... Um, Clearly, certain gestures or certain movements help children uh, recall things from their memory. Um, another thing that I focus on when choosing materials for uh, very young learners is actually kind of an unexpected criteria, but it should be easy to use at home for parents who might not know English very well. Um, so it means that for the materials that I use, I would like to have maybe an audio um, recording so that I can send it to parents and parents would be able to just play it to their kids and children would have something to touch or to play with while listening to this script. Okay? So, um, one of my favorite uh, pieces of material, which I think meets all these criteria, is storyboards. Um, maybe teachers who work with um, preschool kids um, and teachers who especially work with the course book called Playway to English can recognize this. Yes, very good. Um, a couple of words about what storyboards are and why these particular ones. So basically, a storyboard is, um, as you can see, a story broken into maybe four, six or even eight um, pictures. And um, this, um, these two we are looking at are taken from Playway to English 1. But that's almost, as you can see, like page 21 and 35. It's not the beginning of the course. So um, here we can see six pictures. If you look at the beginning of the book, there are going to be just four. So for like, maybe younger kids who uh, will find it more difficult to follow a longer story. So, storyboard is a story broken into um, six or eight parts. And then the best thing about storyboard is that unlike maybe picture books that you would read with your child um, in English, the correlation between uh, the text and the pictures is very straightforward. So, just have one sentence, one picture. And the picture exactly shows um, what the text says. There is an audio track for each storyboard and um, you can have, yeah, like you can provide some listening, um, not only with your own voice. But again, one sentence, one picture with very, very clear correlation. Um, a couple of um, maybe other comments about why I like these storyboards so much. Um, probably if you're a teacher, you have seen that there are, that other course books use storyboards as well. Um, and lots of books for small kids would have such stories and pictures. 
But check out what happens here. In Playway, there is this you, which you hear in every sentence. So what we would later on hear in this story is you are in a car. You step out of the car. So unlike introducing lots of characters that children might find difficult to like recognize in pictures or basically make the story more complicated, here you are the main, um, the main actor, you are the author of the story. And um, I actually think that this was sort of like part of the plan. The authors of Playway, there is Herbert Puchta and Günther Gangros, um, have done a lot of research um, within the field of neurolinguistic programming, and they, I believe, looks like that, know quite a lot about language development. So children listening to these stories and then playing with them can actually themselves be the main, um, the main actor in this story. So what do we do with these stories? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, once again, the um, description of storyboards. This is going to be in the presentation. You can um, remember it later on. So what we do with the storyboard is the following. We would first of all just use the big flashcards. They're part of the course, but you can basically print out the same pictures just enlarged. So we would sit down in a circle with kids all on the floor, look at the pictures, and maybe just see what words they know from the pictures, saying that, hmm, what's this? What's this? It's a car. Okay, you know your English, and this is a... Clearly. Okay, so kids would be just saying maybe single things at this stage. Uh, maybe they was like a girl or um, a tree. But again, they can recognize simple things that they maybe have studied. Um, we would then listen to the whole story. I have this recording here. We'll use it in a second. Um, so listen to the whole story. And then children will be relying on the voice, on the sound that they hear, to actually help them order the whole story. We're doing it together. So here is no strain on a particular student to get the right answer. We're doing it together, recognizing words, and just basically checking what they understand. Mm -hmm. What happens next? Uh -huh. Okay. Right. So um, after we have um, put the cards in more or less correct order, and I can see that children can recognize the story, we then would move individually to our desks or just bring the books. And then um, there are these spaces, yeah, you can probably see that, where you can write the number. Sometimes children don't write numbers because they cannot write numbers, so they can either use dots, and I'm showing like one dot or two dots, or we can use different symbols or just different colors to reconstruct the order. Um, again, with children who are younger or do not um, know so much English um, at this stage, we would use simpler storyboards with maybe just four pictures to avoid confusion. Anyway, potentially children of six um, can do some sort of numbering, and um, then it's time to, um, to check. And what I ask children to do is I take big flashcards, I say out loud the text, and have them tell me if it's number one or two or three. And basically, we just once again put it in the right order on the board. Um, OK, so here is the story. Um, just maybe for the sake of cutting um, down on time, um, this dramatic story is about you who are, is, whatever, driving the car, and then, bam, you see the dog on the road, you get out of the car, dog jumps into the car and drives off, and you run um, after the car. Very dramatic and usually funny, so children enjoy it. What happens next is when we have ensured we all understand the story and have the right order, 
we go through the story sentence by sentence. I say the sentence, children repeat. So um, once again, we would do things like point, repeat, um, point, repeat, just the eight sentences. Things like, you're in the car, and children's like, you're in the car. Um, there is a dog, and children's like, there is a dog. So again, just go through the whole story um, orally. Fun part, we would then stand up and uh, mime the story sentence by sentence. So we would typically, again, in the same order with the teacher who supports all the story, uh, repeat the gestures after me. Um, so I would say, like, you're in a car. And she'll say, you're in a car. And everybody minds driving. Um, there is a dog. There is a dog. So we would go through the story sentence by sentence. <laughs> Um, we would then work on learning the gestures, and we actually focus on repeating different gestures and drilling the pronunciation. Um, play around this, so we do gestures in the right order, in the jumbled order, and then maybe somebody else is a teacher and they give instructions to the class about what to do. And then gradually, through this series of activities, children get to really remember the story and to really learn it. And in the end of the same lesson, children would be telling me the story. So, what's the point? The benefit of storyboards, and storyboards from Playway, not from some, any course book, is that children learn not just single words or phrases, but actually whole sentences. And um, again, within this environment, this English environment they're in, they are able to later on use them um, in um, appropriate situations. And uh, even without looking at grammar and teaching the reads there are, you have actually taught children there's a dog, which I think is a really cool thing for children to acquire and then be able to use, like there is something. Um, also, because you involve um, gesture and there is a little bit of drama and there is so much emotion, um, clearly this language learning is very supported and more memorable, in fact. Um, and one more thing that um, I personally find really, really beneficial in using storyboards is, um, it's the last thing here, it's developing narrative skills. And narrative skills is basically the ability to order things one after another. Um, you have, like probably all mums have seen this in um, children's um, like copy books or books um, and workbooks on a series of subjects where children need to order different things like duck, dog, duck, dog. Okay, so this is a bit of the same but on a different level, right? And um, it's actually something that later on helps children with literacy. They can better make connections between sentences within a text. So ordering a story and then um, maintaining the order is really, really important. So try it. It works. Uh, so, um, to be honest, I don't really uh, believe too much in uh, such uh, stuff. Uh, that's why I want to ask you, maybe you can reassure me. Yeah, I don't uh, believe in that other yeah, stuff either. Yeah. I mean, um, I most uh, believe in uh, patterns uh, which are given to children, like when we start uh, doing something like there is a doll, there is and something, and then they really understand that there is means that when you want to say something about something yeah but uh, in this case do they really understand that there is a dog means that when they want to say that there is something somewhere they need to use there is or it is just memorizing and next uh, class or two classes later they will just uh, forget it and that's it uh, I think like with all language they forget quite a lot I'm not really sure what the question is no, no, I mean um, uh, uh, does this um, um, mean that you still give some patterns before you do this? Patterns like this is something, there is something, or... Yeah, it's a part of learning the language. It's just one type of activity that we do in lessons. 
and it uses some words that children have studied before. So maybe we have studied a unit on um, toys, and there is the word car, and maybe before that they studied um, a topic about because animals. Uh, for me, yeah. it seems like quite difficult uh, yeah, structures and everything for people, uh, for children sure. who just started uh, studying language. That's why I wonder how it works in reality. Uh, for me, it seems like uh, they just uh, learn it, uh, yeah, at the end of the class, they can repeat it, they can tell the story, but two weeks later, they forget everything and they just don't understand what, what it is. Yeah, so what I was saying um, before is uh, this was not from the beginning of the book and uh, there was some learning before it. But the fact that children learn this story in one lesson actually means that they have really developed their skills of repeating things in English and actually saying whole sentences in English. And so by learning the story, they managed to um, acquire, to learn some phrases. And yes, if you don't use them, like with all other language, they're not going to use it themselves and they're not going to remember it forever just because you showed it once in a lesson. But when they have um, maybe a similar model or they hear something similar, that's when they will remember things. No, I just want uh, to add, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I meet quite a lot of children <coughs> who um, know a lot of poems or stories, but they don't really understand uh, some words from them. For example, they say, ah, oh, there ah, is a dog. Okay, it okay, into, okay. Sorry, okay, yes, uh, I got it. it. Sorry, yeah. yes. Uh, so the question is, uh, when they learn this story and they can say things like, there is a dog, do they really know how to use the structure there is? Okay, no. No. But that's not the point. Because to learn a language, it's not like a linear thing. It's not like one day you learn it, next day you learn something new, and then you learn something else, and then you learn something else. No, it's like going in spirals, like you met it once here, and then maybe in a couple of weeks you meet something similar there, and then you meet something else again in a couple of weeks. And then by the end of the year you will be pointing at things like, oh, there is a dog, there is a monster. That's how it works. Okay. okay yeah. Thanks a lot for clarification. Yeah. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. Masha, thank you for your talk. Thank you. I actually have two questions. Uh, why do your lessons last 45 minutes, and who decided? Who decided? I do, and I think that that's the best um, chunk of time for five-year-olds to spend in a group. Um, focused on doing things. It's not a play group. Like I think we talked, like lots of people talked about different formats. This is like something that really resembles a lesson. I mean, we of course do like one million different things, but they're united by the same topic. We work with language. We focus on particular structures, and this actually allows us to have some like results by the end of the year. We don't just like I don't just speak English. I insist on like children repeating things, children saying things to each other, and to do this for like two hours is too much. Children like are are not like that. I think. Okay. And the second one, do you provide them with uh, a kind of home listening? Yeah, of course I do. We, I just like, sent an email to parents and it's like, this is uh, audio for pictures your child has in the folder. So you turn on the audio and have child, your child point at the pictures and have them repeat if possible. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but like, I think typically moms who take kids to these sort of lessons are usually quite interested in um, the results, so they would actually have children repeat every single thing, so that's also part of learning. Okay. I have a technical question about Playway, because I've done these kinds of classes a lot, but with other books. Uh, at which point uh, does it switch from you to like a character in the story? The course, I mean. There are different stories. Like these storyboards are made specifically for you, uh -huh. and then there are other stories in each unit um, they have their own character. There is like Max and Benny or some, some, something. I see. So it gives both. Both, time. yeah. But this one I think is made specifically for you to like drill certain chunks and have children like tell you the story in the end. Hmm? <laughs> um, right. Uh, okay. But I think it's actually, I'm sure it's like somewhere there. Like, have you ever. Yeah. Yes. Like, 
I have a question, two parts of the question. First of all, uh, what's most important to make sure that it's just two, uh, two times a week and 45 minutes? What do you do? Which components are needed to make sure it's um, you have good, great results because it's, it's uh, <laughs> I think we judging by what you were saying later I think we have different idea of great results I don't expect I don't expect children to be like yeah like bilingual or something um, but I think like this early learning is about um, like creating the um, environment a very positive environment where children would like what they're learning and would be interested and would form a positive attitude to English later on so that when they get to the first class in their school and there is maybe not um, like there is a different teacher they would still find it easy to get into learning and so also we learn like lots of uh, phrases so we are working not only with single words but with phrases and it enables children to like say some little things when they travel with parents like can I have and of course, when children see they can do something in this strange language, which is just a crazy collection of other sounds for them, I think, um, they, I think, feel more motivated and like, feel better about themselves. So working with chunks and including a lot of audio input and also having lots of varied activities, like engaging for children naturally, like working with nice books or like making some crafts is important. Second part of the question. Okay. Um, so we had a discussion. Uh, there is this idea that if you start at five, um, and if you start at seven, at the end, by the age of fifteen, you may be having the same result. Do you, you at the age of, if you start at five, by the age of fifteen, you will probably take what FC, right? Like that's my experience. I have this amazing experience of like starting at five or six, and uh, like this group is like about. 14 or like 15 now and like they did FC and I think it's awesome and like so like if they continue with you if they don't just go to the ordinary they school, can go anywhere they, they have some progress. some English already yeah yes I'm sorry we have one more question and then we will need to move on May I ask you about the um, lessons what do you think is it the best way for learning for five years old kids individual or group lessons Oh, of course, group lessons, because children are social. And there is this amazing opportunity. Like, I mean, I'm doing drawing classes myself. And it's amazing. You see, like, 10, people's do, 10 people do the same thing. And you actually start getting the idea of how to do it, even if you yourself is not really, really good at it. And that's what happens with children. Children are very, very different. And I think talking individually to kids, you would find that someone is really shy or they just don't have this... Um, like their mouth or like vocal apparatus is not ready yet. So they will be hearing things said many, many times. They will be like miming what others do. And I think this group situation, the social situation is really more beneficial for small kids. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you.